everyone, and welcome to the Co-Living Code Show. I'm your host, Christine McDaniel, founder and CEO of Kindred, the first CLMS, Co-Living Management System, and Marketplace, where we are on a big mission to help expand the co-living industry through technology. This is the longest running weekly YouTube show and podcast on the topic of co-living since we launched back on July 2018. Everybody knows how passionate I am about co-living and technology, my two favorite subjects that I get to speak around the world on. And at Kindred, we create solutions to find and manage co-living properties all around the world, helping guests easily find the perfect place anywhere and operators able to manage any number of rooms with automation and ease. Our clients range from multinational co-living businesses with thousands of units to individually owned smaller communities. The common thread amongst Kindred users is a passion to live differently in our current world to optimize space, save on cost, and belong to community. So what does it take to make these changes happen? We launched this podcast to dig deeper. We interviewed experts, founders, industry leaders, CEOs, investors, developers, you name it. It's magical when you hear the origin stories of some of the largest co-living operators around the world. You learn their journey firsthand, the good and bad. These are the pioneers of this global movement. Our hope is that you leave these conversations with some new ideas and insights and a greater passion for the future of living. With that in mind, I welcome you to the Co-Living Code Show. Long term, there's a lot of fun stuff to do with real estate in terms of investing. And you see a lot of companies making moves in, you know, off-market properties like Zillow and Redfin and Compass. So I think there's a lot of single family opportunity right now for technology enabled real estate companies. This week, we've got somebody from the Midwest. So you guys know trends in America always start in the coastal cities, California, New York, and then they move inward. And once that happens, then you really know things are taking off. Today, we brought on Johnny Wolf. He's the founder of Homeroom in Kansas City, and he spent 10 years in Silicon Valley living in roommate houses in San Francisco. So he knows this space really well. He moved to the Midwest. First, he was in Austin, Texas to invest in in real estate and he rented out each room of the house. Then he moved to KC in 2018, had a hard time finding good roommates. So he decided to start these homes and he started only a year and a half ago, you guys. We talk about this on the episode. He's got 19 houses and 107 rooms. He's 100% occupied and he's already cash flow positive. We also talk about how they host events and how many people actually show up to those events. And it's really great conversation. I know you guys will enjoy it. Again, first time we've had somebody on from the Midwest of America on the Co-Living Code Show. And enjoy this episode with Johnny Wolf of Homeroom. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of the Co-Living Code Show. I've got Johnny Wolf on. He is the founder of Homeroom in Kansas City. So we've got the Midwest coming into co-living, huh, Johnny? Thank you for coming on to the show. I'm so yeah. excited. Um, yeah, I knew I'm that so was going to happen. Okay, so let's let's start there. Let's start on your background because I know you weren't originally, you know, in the Midwest. And what made you start co-living in Kansas City? Sure. So I went to college at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Um, if you've ever been to San Luis Obispo, I highly recommend it. It's wonderful. Um, and then I came and started my career in the Bay Area. And so when you live in the Bay if, uh, or other parts of California, you you really can't afford your own apartment right out of college. So co-living is really the only option. Um, so I lived, you know, I ran a roommate house in uh, San Jose for about four or five years. Where we rotated people in and out. And it had like, you know, some really cool culture to it. Um, we had, you know, like a chore wheel, which actually is something we stole for home room. Uh, we had, you know, we had a process where everyone was involved in interviewing. Um, essentially, you know, a lot of what that house was is kind of what, um, you know, I brought forward into to home room. And so I was, uh, you know, I'd done a few different roles at startups in the Bay, worked at technology companies as well. And then I wanted to get more into real estate investing. So I moved to Austin, Texas in 2015. And I, you know, invested in a lot of different properties in Austin. And a couple of them I thought it would be really cool to do roommate houses because that's something I was really familiar with. And it went, you know, they went really well. Um, and I wanted to balance my portfolio in, in real estate in Austin with some more cash flow positive real estate in a somewhere else in the, in the United States. So I did a lot of market analysis 
And Kansas City just appeared to be the best kind of cash flow real estate market in the United States. So I moved here and bought uh, you know, an apartment building as well as a single family home, which I had turned into a roommate house. And then um, in 2018 on vacation in Cabo, I kind of just was, had been thinking about roommate houses and you know what, I just thought that the way that how hard it was for me to find roommates in Kansas City when I moved here, the Craigslist experience was worse than in Austin and in San Francisco. So I, I was like, you know, I think there's an opportunity for a company to do this here. And that was before Hub House and Bungalow had actually announced their funding. So I just thought I was the only one doing it and I thought I was a genius. And then about <laughs> 10, day, 10 minutes later, the VC funding was announced for those two. And I was like, oh, I guess uh, I'm actually already behind. So we, um, we have 19 houses, our 19th house in Kansas City Metro is being launched on Wednesday. Um, we currently have 100% occupancy, so we have zero available rooms. Um, and so usually we're pre-booking all of our openings, you know, 45 or 50 days before. So it's, it's going really well. There's definitely a really strong demand in Kansas City like there is in any other city. And so all, so you have 19 houses, 107 rooms already, and that's in like a two-year period? Uh, we Our first house launched about 14 months ago. Oh, gosh. Oh, my gosh. That's fast, Johnny. <laughs> congrats. <laughs> congrats on that. Um, and so, you know, this is everybody's number one question. We, we have kind of broached the subject about co-living work in the Midwest. You know, obviously, the, the rent is really not that much in the Midwest. So, so what's your answer to that? You know, why would they co-live when maybe they can afford an apartment? Yeah. And, uh, you know, we talked, I think we, you and I kind of touched on that mm -hmm. when we were talking about uh, total available market. Um, and I think everyone makes the same exact decision regardless of the price of the city. So, you know, everyone, you know, from Thailand where you can get a, like an apartment for, you know, 50 to a hundred dollars a month or to San Francisco where it's 3000 there's always a cheaper co-living option out there and people are make that decision regardless of where they live. Are they okay with, do they want to live with people? Do they want to connect and do they want to save money versus having privacy? So that's, I think that trade-off exists um, all over the, the scale. And we've definitely seen it. It's the exact same decision that people make here as they would make in San Francisco or New York. And obviously too, the, the cost of living, the wage, so the salaries and the wages, usually are in comparison, right? So in the Midwest, you know, yeah. the hourly rate and minimum wage is less than it would be in the Bay Area. Um, yeah, so maybe absolutely. with all things considered. And then what about community? So essentially you guys are kind of taking, are you guys purchasing every single house? Or are you doing master leases on some of them? Um, so we actually transitioned recently to, well, we do do master leases. We, I own a few of them personally. Um, and I think the long-term goal of the company would be to have a mix of about 20% homeroom owned and 80% um, partnerships where we do a master lease. Uh, the one thing that we're able to do because we're in these cash flow markets is have investors uh, buy properties specifically for homeroom. So, it, which is really cool. We're able to put the setup costs um, onto the investor. So they pay to get the house customized and furnished and they give us some time to get it filled. Um, and that is a really cool investment product for them on the um, real estate side. So if you're a real estate investor, you come to us, you get a three-year guaranteed lease, free property management. But on our side, we get you know, better owners to work with, and we also get a little bit better terms because we create the deal. So it ends up working out for everyone. And so that's sort of the direction we're going, and it's like a unique opportunity, I think, for us where, because of where we're located. I love that. Yeah, and then what's the average? So these are probably six-bedroom houses, right? Like what's the average purchase price? Um, for investors, we're targeting about 200,000 for a property. Nice. And usually, yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> and usually we'll start with three or four bedrooms and we'll convert a couple um, professionally so that it'll be a, you know, yeah. a five or six bedroom house. Perfect. And then when you say, so the 80, 20 rule, right? So you, so you guys just only want to own 20% of the portfolio, 80% master lease for scale. So you could scale quicker. Yeah. I think part of it's scaling quicker. I think. When you, you know, the advantage of our investor purchase model is it's obviously still one for the investor, but they cover a ton of the upfront cost on a per house basis. So they cover during the period where we're renting it, we get, we require 60 days free. Um, so we have the house filled, we may make a little money during that period. Um, they are required to pay for the furniture. They're required to pay for the, the house um, construction that turns it into the house we need. 
So in terms of cash flow, it actually cash flow positive from day one, which house we had. So that's that's a pretty cool ability to scale there versus if you're gonna have 100 houses and pay 10,000 to set it up, you're talking about a lot of money. So that, that's a big reason for that. I also think, you know, as a real estate investor, holding real estate is great, but there's a lot of risk, there's a lot of repairs. Um, you have to have a huge amount of cash to do that. So it may be something, you know, in two or three years, we go to a, you know, a family office or a private equity firm and say, hey, if you give us, you know, 20 or $30 million to buy these houses, we can guarantee you your, your returns are gonna be awesome because we know how to maximize the cash flow on the property. But it's something that I think as we're growing it, that slows things down a little bit. Um, and also it's, it, it sucks cash. So. Yeah. Well, you never know who's listening or watching this show. We've already paired up some, some developers and investors and operators. So anybody listening, yeah, if, you, if you're looking to invest in the Midwest. Um, and again, it's so, I mean, you get so much more. And, you know, especially us in California, we know, we know that, yeah. that, that's a great market, and especially Kansas City. So, so you're in how many different cities in that area right now? Yeah, so we're in a, the Kansas City Metro, and that's and this is sort of confusing. I didn't really know it when I was lived in California. Um, but Kansas City is actually, it's on the state line between Missouri and Kansas. The biggest part of the Kansas City Metro is Kansas City itself, which is in Missouri. Um, and that's a bit, a bit over a million people. And we're there a lot. Half of our houses are in the Kansas City, Missouri area. There's also Kansas City, Kansas, right across the straight line. And then there's a county called Johnson County, which is actually the 82nd richest county in the United States, which is crazy. Um, and so we're, we have, there's five cities in that county that we're in as well. So we're in six cities, but all really close to each other. And then out of curiosity, you know, you, you went to college in California, you lived in the Bay Area, you moved to Austin, Texas, which is yeah. an amazing, I love that city. Love um, how do you like Kansas? Like, are you in the Midwest? Like, are you happy there? Like, that's such a difference, right? Yeah, it's a huge change. I think um, it's definitely been something that I, it's hard for me to really weigh in because the first five, four months I was here, I actually you know, got out and did stuff and then I started homeroom and then I haven't really <laughs> given it a, you know, a social chance because I'm a solo founder and, you know, we have limited financing and all that. So um, it's, but the last couple of months that I've been looking for uh, basically our employee two and three. Um, full time. I've connected with some of the startup community and it's been cool. So there's some really cool entrepreneurs in Kansas City. You just have, but you just have to kind of go find them. Yeah. And then are you guys raising, so are you bootstrapped? I mean, I, I love the model of bringing in the investors to buy the properties and be mm. cash flow positive out the gate. That's incredible, right? Um, are you guys looking to raise institutional capital? Uh, you know, it depends. I think um, we're trying to build so we don't have to. Uh, and we raised, you know, we had a, we had a, we just did a friends and family raise, uh, six figures uh, in, in December. So we're pretty, you know, we don't need money and we don't forecast that we'll need money. I think when we expand to other markets, you know, in the Midwest, that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, I think if we'd be open to the right investor, but I think we'd be also open to bringing in equity at this point. Awesome. No, that yeah. makes sense. And then the, um, yeah, so talking more about, you know, so you guys are setting up, you know, you've got these different homes and you've got, you know, 107 residents. How do you guys, how do you build community amongst all these residents? Yeah, um, you know, that's, um, that's a challenge in and of itself. I think one of the things is we have technology platforms. Um, we have an app and so people can all chat with each other on like a general house channel. We have, you know, obviously like some fa a Facebook group. We do social events. We had like a, we basically uh, did a, so we did a so far show in one of our living rooms, which was really cool. Um, and then we've done like a bottomless mimosa brunch. We had a kickball team. So we just try to like, you know, do things that we want to do as like a, a staff. <laughs> and then we just make it so everyone can do it. We, we sponsor it. So that's something that in 2020, I would really want to um, work on. I think, you know, our residents are super excited about, well, you know, what the dream of home room is, but the challenge of really connecting people is something I think we need to invest in heavier in 2020. So, Yeah, like what percentage of the residents usually typically show up to any event? The Mimosa Brunch we did in August had um, uh, 65 out of 80. Whoa. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it was, it was super heavily attended. Uh, the uh, house show, I think probably... Had 60 out of 100 so they're, oh, they're pretty well 
Yeah. yeah, they're pretty well attended. Yep. That's amazing. And then do you guys curate the people that you put in each home? Like how do you guys roommate match? Yeah. So, you know, kind of at the end of the part of that, we do a lot of screening up front. Like one thing we realized pretty early is if you don't, if you try to just let candidates go on tours a lot and it just exhausts everybody, <laughs> like including the roommates or they, you want to make sure that people are like very committed to living there before you, you do any kind of roommate uh, discussion. But our last step is to actually have a, we do a video interview with all the current roommates and then the, uh, the, the candidate. And so we, we help curate, we, we set up the time and it's a part of living with us that you need to be on those calls. Do they see the bios? Do they know anything about the housemates that are already living there before they commit? Yeah, we do have, um, we have bios on our, on our house pages that kind of talk a little bit about the current residents. Um, and so when they kind of go through and look at the house and take the virtual tour and all that, they can see who lives there. Cool. No, and yeah. thanks for sharing. Cause again, like on this show, like I just love bringing on like anybody that has to do with any aspect of co-living. Cause there's so many different models and different ways people mm -hmm. are doing it. They'll come sure. to me and say, Christine, like what's, what's the right way or what's the true way. And I'm like, well, again, it's just like, there's so many different models and it's exciting to see, um, yeah. you know, again, as long as there's the community being that built, um, it's, it's been really cool, you know, whether it's a platform play or multiple houses or one big building with all the residents in one building, uh, yeah. it's, it's been neat to see. Yeah, I can imagine there's, and there's, I think, you know, we know who are leading the industry so you can watch those guys and see how they're doing it. Um, but they're, I don't even, they're pretty early too. So there's not really <laughs> an established, like, this is the best way to do it. I think in like three years, we'll probably have a pretty people will have figured out like the best kind of everything. But right now it's still kind of up for grabs. So. Oh, for sure. And so many different models. I yeah. mean, as long as they're disrupting the multifamily, you know, the apartment communities, the 300 units where you don't know your, I never knew any of my neighbors, even if we shared sure. a wall. Um, yeah. So I think that, that that's really shifting um, quickly, which is kind of cool on how yeah. people are finding places to live. What's different in your opinion, co-living in the Midwest versus like the major, you know, coastal cities? Mm, that's a, you know, I think uh, we're broker. <laughs> so, you know, I think that's one of the things. Um, and um, part of, you know, the lower price point and part of the, you know, is that it generates less gross margin on a per house basis. Mm -hmm. So we do have to be, I think, a little bit leaner and a little bit more, um, I don't know, creative <laughs> with a lot of our stuff. A lot of our stuff has to be, has to be less people, less time, um, and has to be remotely done, be able to be done remotely. So that's one of the things that we've done to adapt to uh, the Midwest. I think the Midwest is just really excited about what we're doing because they're like, I would expect this to be in New York or San Francisco. So a lot of people that they hear about, they're like, yeah, the Midwest is cool too, you know, like they, we have innovative stuff. And so that's, um, that's kind of a cool, unique thing. Whereas like in San Francisco, I think we probably just blend in and not be that notable here. You know, people are pretty excited about what we're doing and uh, reach out to us a lot. So that's cool. Yeah. I mean, you guys are the only ones still, right? In your area, in your town that you're yeah, aware of? There's, yeah. there's no one else here doing it. There's some, yeah, I think, yeah, that's it. And I don't know if there's anyone doing it. Um, I know that Bungle is in Chicago, but that's not, Chicago is really yeah. like a cool, cool city really. But in terms of the, the smaller, less than a million people kind of cities that are, you know, our price point, I don't know of anybody else. So. And what's your demographic? Like what's the ratio of guys and girls and what's the age range? Uh, you know, the age range, we were over 21. We, uh, <laughs> some of our early residents were like 19 and it, it was not good. And so we decided that over 21 is the way to go. Um, and, uh, so that's one of the things we, um, you know, we don't have any hard age restrictions other than that, um, but our average age is about 27. Um, so in the mix, I actually used to skew heavily male. Um, and then we got a lot better at our sales and generation on that. And it's actually sort of tipping towards more female lately. I think it's because women are in, like the, the platform that we have, it feels safer. It feels more managed. I think in general, Craigslist roommate living is probably mostly male, but I think a lot of the women that we come in contact with are really excited about living with us because like furnished, uh, we take care of, you know, we screen everyone. So there's that safety factor that really appeals to them. 
And is that, so is that your direct competitor essentially? It's somebody either using like, like Craigslist obviously to find a vacant room or yeah. Facebook? Like where else are they looking? Yeah, I think that that is everyone's direct competitor. I mean, if they're, unless you're in San Francisco and it's like your, your hub house and bungalow are competing against each other. Um, I think everyone's direct competitor today is, you know, the person that owns their own house and is renting out rooms because at the price theoretically for that person, could, any amount of money you make from that is good, right? So you don't really need to think about pricing and all that, right? Where we in co-living, we need to make a margin. So sometimes, I, so I really do think that that's the, um, that and the people that will go get our, their own house. But I think, you know, the better we, we get at this, the more that we compete with them on price, but also just, it's just better experientially. For sure. And now I'm, you know, back to the age range. I laugh because even at Kindred Quarters, we had a 19 year old move in and I had, you know, another, I had another resident and she was, she's a lawyer, right? So she said, we need to, Christine, you need to make an addendum that says, you know, the alcohol about alcohol and stuff like that. Cause you don't want to be held liable for somebody right. drinking underage in the house. So I know it's just, I, I think you're right. I think he, he was amazing. There was no issues ever, but yeah. you know, I think a lot <laughs> of operators yeah, have the 21 and older cause it cuts out a little bit of that yeah. um, liability if they're drinking or in the house or something. I don't yeah, know. I mean, it's the maturity issue too. I think, you know, we were looking for a very communicative adults and like, oh, yeah. if you're about an adult and you're not a good communicator, then what we're doing, can't work with you because we all need to kind of work together to make certain things happen and so you know we can't you can't be like recluse and you can't be immature so those are the two most important things that we're looking for when we when homeroom is screening other than like the basic credits background check stuff so nice no you're exactly right and, and again that average age of co-living since it's like 25 to 35 you mm -hmm. have more mature individuals there's not, you know, they're adults versus if you had 18 to 25 is like your range, you know, they're right out of home. They haven't lived with strangers before. <laughs> They've only lived yeah, at home. It, you know, it could be a different, it's a different dynamic, yeah, obviously. I mean, one person in that younger demo is okay. But when you start to have a whole house like that, I think it can be a problem. So. Yeah. And so the, what's the average stay? Do you guys have a minimum lease term and what's the average? Our minimum is six months. Um, and, um, July, August, and September, we actually require nine months because we don't want leases ending in February and January um, because that's a tough time to lease and we don't, we like to kind of relax a little bit. Um, so we do that, but yeah, six months is our standard lease and it goes, it renews for another six months right after that. So we don't do month to month because um, we want people that are going to be committed to the house for a while. Um, and since we have residents do interviews, like, if they have to do that too much, you know, oh, yeah. have six residents, it just becomes a little exhausting. Um, and people that are looking to stay for a while, I think, invest more in the house. So with that, there's a lot of reasons for the longer. Six months is not that long, but, you know, we're really looking for people to stay a year and a half to two. We don't really know how long our average stay is because we're only oh, yeah. 14 months old. Um, but we do have people that, were in, that are still here from October. So, so our, uh, 14 months is, uh, you know, our current record. Every day it gets longer. That's awesome. And then the chores, you mentioned a chores wheel. Like yeah. how, how do people divvy up the chores? Uh, we have a chore wheel that we provide where you can like write the chores and spin and it rotates. Um, we had it like graphically designed um, and I stole it from my roommates in like San Jose. So, um, so they, that's an option. We don't like require them to do that. Uh, we do do the cleaning services, but you know, we encourage like them to meet or they're required to meet once a quarter kind of make sure that they're giving up household responsibilities. Oh, so they only collectively meet to like discuss house things once a quarter? Yeah, we don't, we don't want to be overbearing on that. And it, some of the houses meet a lot more, um, but we're, you know, it's, it's really kind of a house by house basis. Some houses, you know, we have folks that are like getting their masters and have a job and like they're just not available. And there's a couple houses that have medical students. So it's like, you know, we don't want to, yeah, so I, I, I like the weekly roommate dinner and we encourage that. We encourage stuff like that as much as we can and we, you know, we highlight it, but it, the requirement is just once a quarter. Got it. No, that makes sense. And then do they, so they just did, you said you provide house cleaning, like a weekly for the common areas? Yeah, we do common, house, common area cleaning. It's once a month. Oh, once a month. Okay. 
So they need to take care of most of their stuff, but to make sure it never gets too bad, then we have the, the cleaning. So. Awesome. And yeah. then let me see here. So do you live separately or do you live at one of the co-living homes? I'm in one right now. Yeah, I live in one. Oh, and nice. Our office is one is actually at the house as well. So, so you have your you live there. You have your office, and then some of the housemates. Five. Yeah. Okay. Cool. There you go. I always love asking that question because it's kind of split down the middle with operators if they live on site or not. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a good idea. I mean, there are some things like, you know, that I mean, they tell you as a startup founder you should be deep in the product and deep in the customer experience, and like, I don't know if there's a better way than living with it. Um, obviously I'm super busy, so I can't, it's like, I preach community, but like, I'm too busy for like community, which is kind of like a, I feel like a hypocrite a little bit, but, um, yeah, so it's, it's cool. And I think, you know, eventually I'll move out I, and I'll kind of, you know, you know but I, you know, I've caught some issues like the lawn wasn't getting cut like the way we needed it to. And it's like my house. So I know, you know, and so we caught some ops issues just by me being in the house. We caught some by us being officed in one of the houses. So. Yeah, it's been good. No, no, no. And I think that's super smart. But one one operator, you know, the joke is he always says it's like you're literally like living in your business with your customers 24 seven. You're like yeah. in, your, in your store. But again, I, you know, I did the same, that's, the same thing. That's true. It is, that's that, I mean, like, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not perfect. It's like, perfect. yeah. Yeah, you are. You never leave. You never leave. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's a different, because again, I go back and forth, right? And so it's a different energy too. I don't know. It's, but again, I, I mean, you have to do it, in my opinion, especially in the beginning, because you do, you're, you build out systems and you see things you'd never see if you weren't like living in your business. Yeah. I think like, as soon as you're ready though, it's like a good time to get out because it, it, you know, so I'd say like by the end of this year, I hope to be like somewhere else. Not that I do like co-living. I just think it's, you know, for the roommate's sake, I think it's less freedom, you know, like they, they know, like their landlords, that's the CEO of the co-living company slash the company office is all here. They're all pretty cool about it, but I do feel like a little bad, like, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm a chill roommate, but you know, I yeah. want them to have the full experience without feeling like they're being watched or, you know, like in a, in basically a guinea pig, you know, laboratory. A laboratory, <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. And then again, just for you too, because yeah, I think I, I always had like a constant anxiety. I would like see if anything was wrong. I would want to fix it real quick. So like, sure. I didn't want to relax. I just wanted to make sure it was like an amazing experience for everybody else living there while I was yeah. living there. Um, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Which is like crazy. But um, yeah. do you guys have co-working space like in the homes? Mm -hmm. No, we don't. All of ours are single family properties. They have yeah. like usually a living room and a dining room. So if they need to work then the dining room is probably the spot or their, their room. Definitely. And then you said, so I know you guys use Slack to kind of let the housemates communicate with each other. What other technology tools do you guys use? Um, we, I mean, we're, we're kind of use, um, you know, the Buildium suite, which is, uh, I think we're the, we're the only ones that do that. Everyone else did that folio, good for them. But um, I think, and um, yeah, and so that's, it's okay. I mean, I think everyone hates property management software. So what you guys are doing is, is really cool. Um, it's the lack of open API makes you want to just scream all the time. Um, yes. But I mean, it's cool because it's all yeah, it's all there, and so you're just like, okay, it's all here. It kind of trains you on property management by using a software that is only property management, but it is limiting. I was talking to a friend at Bongo recently, and you know, he, they just got off property management software altogether and just built their own thing because you know they just hated the the, the limitation. So that's, I mean, that's a big cog to what we do. Slack, we have our own, we have a homeroom co-living app. It's on the, I, the app store, Android and Apple. Um, and that's required to get your key code. You have to download that. Um, and that's how you interact with our staff and with other people as you go through that. And so it's, it's Slack powered, but you go in through the app and you, you may not even know that you're in Slack because it's through our app. So. Oh, so yeah. Slack's the back end or the communication tool. Yeah, yeah, and so is Buildium. And so everything feels like our app, but it's a lot of our software in the back end. Um, we use Box. I mean, that's pretty typical. I think Box is the best. It's amazing software. Um, yeah, Outlook Suite. I think I think if you want to go big and you want to have a real company, I think um, the G Suite event you eventually outgrow it. So we yeah. started started with Microsoft. So um, it's a little heavier, but yeah. And so we're currently looking for a CRM system for our investor side. Um, that's something that we're 
we're struggling with right now, but we hope to have something in the next month. But Salesforce is good, but it's too heavy for a company of our size. So we're just trying to, so if you know a good CRM, feel free to send me a message. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're, yeah. we're, we're working on building that in too, just so you know. Because <laughs> okay. you can have multiple investors per house on the, each house. Really? Oh, no, I'm, yeah, do you, no, I'm asking, do you guys have oh, multiple investors that will come I thought you were like, that that me about your software. I was like, that's interesting. <laughs> um, no, we don't. It's, it's single family. I mean, like, well, we, I guess so. I mean, I guess we don't really care, but we're not doing, you know, there's, um, you can get accredited investors to buy like shares in like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, basically a house. We're, we're not doing that. I know that Roofstocks started to do that. Um, we're, you know, we want to keep it pretty simple, one owner. I mean, if it, a couple people want to partner and buy a property, that's fine. Yeah. As long as we just have to send the check to one person, if we had to send it to two, that'd be okay. Long term, there's a lot of fun stuff to do with real estate in terms of investing. And you see a lot of companies making moves in, you know, off market properties like Zillow and Redfin and Compass. So I think there's a lot of single family opportunity right now for technology enabled real estate company. So we're excited to be on both sides, co-living and the kind of single family real estate stuff. So. No, I love, love, love that. And especially after the, you know, again, I think it's, it's such a more long-term solid strategy. And I guess, you know, especially with the master leases now, you know, that's a little bit of a struggle in the sense of what happened with WeWork, which everybody just saw, you know? Yeah. So it's like, if you guys are owning the property and there's an asset tied to it and, you know, and you guys are, you know, hundred percent occupied and you, you're growing quickly, um, that looks really, really good for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely love to buy. I think it's just the, and we, we probably would buy if we got the capital and it's, I think it's more that the, you know, if we get to 40, if we double again and we keep growing, I think it'll be pretty easy for us to raise money to buy these houses. It's just, it's just a matter of time. Like when, when we're ready to pull the trigger there. So. Yeah, no. And that's my next question. So what's your guys is like your, your vision, like, you know, for this year, next year, 2020, we're already in 2020. 2020. All right. So 2020 is uh, build the team. So we, you know, we, I started the company pretty, you know, uh, with a lot of like uh, part-time help and I was working a full-time job and they were like doing a lot of the stuff and I was like, you know, you know, moonlighting. Um, and we added, you know, one of the, we ended up kind of like phasing into like a full-time second employee and that didn't work out. So we're looking to basically add a second full-time employee and a third full-time employee this year. That's going to be a founding team. Uh, essentially we have, a couple of folks that we really like um, a couple of them one of them is out of California um, and so so yeah basically build that team I think the proof of concept is there and so now we just need to find the right people that can develop it a bit more um, in 2021 I'd love to see us expand to a second market um, if we're ready um, but yeah 20, 2020 is building the team I want to see community engagement and improve dramatically I feel like there's a lot there. A lot of people are really excited about our product. Like we haven't done anything. They just need like a, like a soft wind to blow them into just loving us. Right. But we, we just don't have the time or energy or bandwidth to facilitate that or kind of pull it out of them. And then um, the, the real estate investment side is something that's pretty new to us. We launched that product in October. And so we really need to figure out how to get the investors like a, a pool of them and then get a, get the houses sourced. We may do flips into the co-living. So there's, there's a lot of things that we're sort of looking at. Um, it's, it's helpful that I have like that real estate investor background and I've done those things before. So we're just trying to pair those two and that, that getting a, you know, essentially like 20 investors lined up to buy houses in 2020 is to get those houses. Is a little part so you of do want to, so you want to double within the year. I'd love to, yeah. as long as, we, yeah, as long as we can get the investor that, that piece. Right. So that getting someone to drop 40 grand to buy a house and then, you know, that's something that we've, we've done it, but getting the pipeline built is sort of a whole new sales cycle. We're sort of in month three right now. So. Oh, that makes sense. No, that's awesome. And so the, how about, and again, congrats on your turnout for, I think you're, you're being a little hard on yourself. I mean, if you guys are having that high of a percentage show up to your events, that is incredible. That's probably some of the yeah. huge, like biggest ratio. And again, you're spread out. It's not like you're all in one building. You have yeah. a higher turn up rate than, than a, the operations that are in one building. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of jealous of those one building people. It's so much easier. <laughs> Jeez, our maintenance guys drive around. Uh, God bless them. They're all over the place. So 
Yeah, yeah. new and do you have like a maintenance ticketing system? Like that must yeah. be yeah, okay. Yeah, we do. We do, and it's it's okay. I think we're looking looking to kind of improve that, but uh, it, it works for now. So. Oh, good. That's good to know. I know, and, and Johnny, like, so everybody listening, like, you know, he was so sweet. He reached out. You know, I think I put it on LinkedIn. I was like, we're trying to calculate the TAM total addressable market for not just co living globally, which is one crazy number. But even like yeah. software for, you know, for Kindred, obviously we're the software for co-living. So that number, yeah. you know, is smaller, but, uh, but yeah, and he jumped on and was like, Hey, Christine, I'll talk to you. And, and so, and you mainly, cause you've been just obviously watching the numbers in the States, right? Yeah. So, I mean, international expansion is something that we're obviously totally interested in, but when you have 19 houses in Kansas city, you're like, let's start with like <laughs> Dallas, <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> So I, yeah, we, you know, when we did our, um, you know, we just have a pitch deck that when investors come talk to us, we can send to them. Um, so it's sort of ready, but, um, we, uh, we just basically calculated the number of people that match like kind of our age criteria, uh, don't have pets or s not married, um, have credit above, I think it was 650, uh, clean criminal background. And then we try And then the biggest variable that's a little tricky is like, how many people of those people are open to living in a six bedroom house? That's the question. And I don't think I, we have a great answer for that, but we did 10%. So it ended up being like a $2 billion market annually in the Midwest alone. We're like, and I was like, yeah, we should probably do this. seems like a good idea. Um, so yeah, so that's how we did it. It's a bottoms up multiplication. Yeah. Um, I, you said that you talked to some investment bankers on your side, I'm sure, I'm guessing they probably did something similar to bottoms up, but they might've done tops down. I, I have no idea. No, we did both. <laughs> oh, you did both. Okay. Wow. Yeah. But we, but again, for like the software market, it's easier going top down, right. Comparing to a PMS system and hotel management. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of, you yeah. know, is going the other way. So then we started doing the other way, but the numbers, again, the numbers are so, they're not solid numbers. You're looking at, you know, when you try to pull like, okay, how many co-living beds are there in the world? But then there's pipe, you know, there's, there's actual people occupying them, there's pipeline, and then there's like future, not even signed concepts. <laughs> so it's just a lot of numbers we're trying to distill, but we're almost there. And so, yeah, Johnny's like, Christine, did you get that done yet? I'm like, oh my God, we're still on it. It's like two weeks. It's two weeks. Yeah. Cool. Um, um, we're almost there. And, we're almost there. Yeah, that's, I mean, honestly, like, yeah, total available market is honestly like, <laughs> it's one of those slides that I think if you're like, and I don't know, I'm not, I've never been in the PE or VC side. I think they're just really want to see like big. Is it huge? Is it a billion multi Oh, yeah, it has to be over a billion. They don't even, they um, would laugh. If it's over a billion, then like, they might okay. invest. Yeah, and they want to know like, with some reasonable certainty that that's not completely fabricated. And so that's really the, that's all they care. It's like, I feel like you could just put a slide up like bigger than a billion and then they just like put a check mark like, okay, cool. Next. So it's. Um, uh, no, they're getting a little savvy now. <laughs> they want you to dive in. A, well, they want even like, it's not even just Tam, it's Sam and then it's Psalm. So it's serviceable, like obtainable market. So you've right. got them like, okay, out of that market, like what's the obtainable, like realistically of that yeah. market? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, because you're not going to get all two bill. You're not going to get all of it. No. So that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, I guess I meant for that simplicity is for the slide and like your pitch deck is like, they, that's just like one of the check boxes. But it's super cool that you had someone do all that due diligence. That must be there. I mean, they're very serious about investing in you guys. Yeah, no, no, no. They're very, everybody's helpful. So we had multiple people, even people from other countries kind of chiming in. So it was like a group effort on a Google doc. So, so see it, it's sometimes it takes a village because all of us kind of want, you know, want to know those numbers. Right. And we all yeah. have pieces of the puzzle that we're putting together. Um, yeah. So yeah, so it's fun. You learn a lot. You learn a lot of acronyms. You learn a lot. Of oh man. But again, it's a yeah, market that didn't exist before. Right. You know, they keep, you keep comparing it to a roommate market but that's not necessarily correct either because now you even have you know baby boomers and like senior living and people that would not you know want to live with strangers but you know do they want to stay at their home alone or does a co-living community with events and you know just yeah. that's more appealing than going on craigslist and like living with a stranger i think yeah. that's what's kind of shifting right so it's a market that's like evolving so quickly 
totally yeah and i mean there has i mean like there was like kind of a little mini wave of like roommate matching apps too but i think everyone i think it's just that's not quite enough i think that's why co-living is is so cool because you you get the whole pick you get everything you get the rent matching and you get the house and you get kind of the community aspect so yeah like, that's cool and you're right no one knows it's a lot of work though so like you do want to know that like it's big like because <laughs> because otherwise go do something else right because coding is not easy so. well proper i mean essentially i mean i tell everybody it's like hospitality blended with with property management and yeah. those are both very hard, you know, yeah. services to provide. Those are very consumer facing, you know, industries, both of them. And you're yeah. literally, it's what, it's a merger of the two and it's hard, it's higher on the hospitality side. So I always tell people, I'm like, it's think of it like a hotel, like even more yeah. than just a property management company where you're fixing things and taking a check. No, there's a lot of more touch points, I think similar to a hotel, like a service, depending on the co-living community. A hotel where everyone like can like, <laughs> yeah, it's more, it's more intimate than a hotel because yeah, there's the shared space is So yeah, close. So yeah, it is, there's a lot of touch and we have Slack and we use it a little bit for support and we're thinking about like shutting that bad boy down because it's gotten a little crazy with a hundred people and like Slack support it starts. So I think what, what we're starting to do is, we're, we're going to put the Slack behind our app going forward so that they can't really reach us for the support. And we're going to start using kind of our ticketing system a little bit more diligently. So. Oh, cool. And that's a good idea. Cause I think then the requests, I think they'll have to think the request out more before they submit. Right. Yeah. Is that what's, are you yeah. just getting like crazy requests for like the little, it's, it's more just like random Slack messages on my phone at like two in the morning. you know, it's like, it's not like I have it on super loud alert, but it's like, you know, you can't have like live chat support yourself, 102 people, you know, you got to kind of train your peeps how to, you know, interact with the business essentially. And but for it's been a free for all for a little bit too long. So they have some bad habits. So that's something we're going to definitely fix in the I, next two or three no, months. I'm sure there's operators like shaking their head as they're listening to you say that. Yeah. Is it like, but do you have set business hours? Like, this is a great question. Is it like, hey guys, like a regular property management company would be open from like nine to five, Monday through Friday, submit your request for light bulb to be changed or no, they're just, it's like 24 seven. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're not going to like run out that we don't change light bulbs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> change theirs. But, um, uh, we, um, they have our Slack direct number or Slack, ID so they could just they'll just DM us anytime that's 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 the problem so I think we need a we're thinking we probably need to pull our slack environments into a company one and a, and a just kind of a community one and so I think or so maybe, that, or maybe it's when they think of it right so like from the customer perspective maybe it's like oh let me just shoot this over now before I forget you, right. know, how, um, you know how long day at work and then you guys respond when you're back in right mm, yeah that's that see that would that would work just fine okay, yeah. I think <laughs> I, my issue is like I want to solve it every yeah. problem immediately, and so if I get it at two a.m., I'm gonna be like I'm solving this now, and so I think it, maybe it's partially my temperament a little bit as well. No, look at that! You're going above and beyond for your residents. No wonder you're 100 <laughs> percent occupied and got a waiting list. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, that's not scalable. You're like you're like okay, how are we gonna double that? <laughs> yeah, my girlfriend's gonna kill me. So. Oh no! Yeah. yeah. So. Perfect. Well, Johnny, thank you so much for coming on. I have one last question. Uh, yeah. Question I ask everybody is, where do you see co-living? So let's fast forward 10 years to the year 2030. Mm. Where do you see co-living? Hmm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the coolest things about what we're going to see with co-living is the ability to kind of, you know, we talk, you know, there's, there's companies like Ollie who, you know, like you could go different places um with with your co-living space but i think as we see the market um the co-living market uh, go everywhere um, we'll probably see some partnerships where we see the ability to instant transfer between let's say homeroom takes over the midwest and bungalow and um hub house they they fight over the coasts and then you know we or and every there's people all over that you know in between um and where you can just kind of like you know switch you know and i know coliving.com is kind of uh, met, you know, interested in that concept just a little bit in terms of bookings. I don't know if they're the ones or not to be the ones that do that, but I think being able to really have that, being able to migrate instantly, not being out, not knowing that you can go to a new city and not worry about it, is something that 
I think would be it would be really cool. And it's something that the trend for us doing that is part of what started COVID to begin with. But it's not really a reality if you go to a lot of cities yet, right? It's so I think it's gonna be really cool to see the ability to to transfer with no problem like that. So well, kudos to you for being a trailblazer in the Midwest of the United States. Yeah. And I know we have yeah. around the world that listen to the show. And so I was yeah. like, yes, we found somebody that, you know, again, <laughs> and, you know, cause, cause early adopters are always in the big cities. Right. And then yeah. it's spread, you know, inward, then it's like, okay, this is like a movement that's here. Yeah. to stay. Definitely, man. It's it, every day that every day that, that we feel like that more. So. Awesome. Well, thanks again. And I promise to share my data for the TAM. As soon as we wrap yes. it up, I will send it to you. <laughs> send me the Excel, man. I want to see the Excel. For sure. For sure. Okay. okay. Right. Awesome, Johnny. Thanks. Thank you so much for checking out today's episode. If you want to learn more about co-living, you could check out my book on Amazon, The Co-Living Code. And of course, if you're looking for the perfect software to power your co-living concept, check out kindred.io. K-N-D-R-D.io. Thanks. And a quick thank you to SPX Agency for all of the graphics, animation, and design on our YouTube channel.